Today on Monkey Life. Alison and Jeremy undertake one of the park's biggest primate rescues in recent years, from a zoo in mid Wales. I believe the local authority have refused them all forms of permissions and licensing, so they cannot keep a lot of the wild animals that they have on site. And once there, they need to come up with a plan. It's not easy and makes both Jeremy and I a little bit nervous. Plus, greedy Gibbon Kim is stumped by a sock. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. She's alert, um, looking around. Quiet though, which is nice. All good. The park provides a home for more than 260 primates from 24 different species. It's all systems go at the park this morning as Alison and Jeremy prepare for one of their biggest primate rescues in recent years. Each box, Jeremy needs an arrow up and a live animal hoo ha. A week ago, Alison was contacted by the owners of a small zoo in mid Wales in need of help. The owners, I think, purchased the zoo with not a lot of knowledge and understanding of how to look after wild animals, but um, they've struggled and it's been quite a number of years and now I believe the local authority have refused them all forms of permissions and licensing. So not only can they not be open to the public anymore, they also cannot keep a lot of the wild animals that they have on site. So they've got two male capuchins and then there's a pair of patis monkeys. So we're gonna try and head out early today so we can get across to Borth and look at the facilities, which are sort of basic, um, and figure out a plan for getting everybody into their boxes tomorrow morning. Yeah, everything's fingers crossed on all fronts. Tracy Tweedy and her husband, Dean, bought the zoo near Aberystwyth in Wales four years ago. Unfortunately, the couple's plans didn't work out. They experienced a number of difficulties, resulting in negative publicity. And then, earlier this year, the business was compulsorily wound up. Our business went into liquidation in February, um, and the license, our zoo license, was in the business name. Um, so we didn't, we haven't got a choice. We had to move them. Um, and you know, I've met Alison Cronin before, and. You know, out of all the places, you know, primate places there are, that that's where I'd want them to go. Um, for 100% is the best place for them. And, you know, if they can't stay here, then at least I know they're going somewhere where they're going to be really looked after. Hi, Lily. Come on, then. It was a, a real shame that things kind of panned out the way they did. For four years, they've been my babies, and, you know, now they're going. Some of the larger animals, including the lions and lynx, have already been rehomed by other zoos. And Alison has agreed to take on four of the primates. She's also going to box up and transport a vervet monkey who's going to another rescue centre. The aim is for the two capuchins to be integrated in one of the five established groups already at the park. Alison has more concerns about housing the two patus monkeys. We're going to try them in with the Gwenans, like Mitsa did, um, and keep everything crossed. I'm not sure whether or not the Gwenans are now substantial enough of a family group that they're not going to accept anybody into their territory, um, whether these patis monkeys would look at young Gwenans as tasty snacks. So we'll have to wait and see. We're going to unload the Patus monkeys into the Gwenin house, give it a little bit of time, and see if we think the introductions are possible. Um, if they don't 
fit in. I've already made arrangements that have been guaranteed that I've got a home for them elsewhere um, with other patus monkeys, potentially, if it doesn't work out. But we're somewhat hopeful that it could. The van is loaded and everything is set for the 200-mile journey to Borth. If all goes well, Alison and Jeremy will return tomorrow with four new primates and work will begin to settle them into life at the park. Of all the outside enclosures at Monkey World, perhaps one of the most spectacular is the tree-filled area Golden Cheeked Gibbons Kim and Tien call home. It's full of shrubs, offering plenty of seasonal food for the pair to find, and tall trees, allowing them to travel through the canopy high above the ground. This enclosure is absolutely perfect. I don't think you could get a better one. It's completely natural. It's all open air, um, so there's no roof. Uh, the trees are cut back to a certain distance away from the fence line, so the gibbons can't actually swing and get out. And we've put up ropes here, there and everywhere to connect all the branches so that they can brachiate and do what gibbons naturally do in the wild. Also around the edge of the enclosure, you'll notice a lot lower lying bushes and, and trees. And this is natural browse so they can graze at it when, however they like to. Like all the primates at the park, Kim and Tien are provided with regular meals throughout the day, all carefully calculated and balanced to ensure variety and, most importantly, a healthy diet. So that is their lunch and their tea. And they'll have this for the morning. Recently, the team have noticed a problem. Female Kim is putting on a bit of weight. Even though the two have a lovely pair bond, um, and they're very rarely seen apart from one another. Kim will definitely be more dominant when it comes to the food. So this pulley feeder is the closest to the house. So what will happen is Kim will come out, she'll come to this one, and Tien will have to travel to the one at the back. And what we were finding was when we were putting out, say, their nicer things like their root or their fruit, Kim would go and blitz the enclosure eat up all the food, and Tien didn't have much say in the matter. To rectify this, help Tien get his fair share and manage Kim's weight, the Gibbon team have come up with a new feeding regime. Breakfast will now be low calorie, made up of vegetables such as lettuce and fennel. It'll still be hoisted up in the high feeders at opposite sides of the enclosure, but the pair's afternoon feed of more high calorie food will be served indoors. The pair are used to their morning routine. Tien is let out first. And today, he's happy to sit for a while and snack on a piece of banana offered to encourage him into the tunnel. But Kim's out like a rocket, heading straight for the nearest feeder. As with all golden cheat gibbon pairs, she's the dominant one. And when it comes to food, she's very focused and a fast eater. She uses one arm to hang from a branch, stabilising the basket with her feet, while reaching in to pick out the food with the other, demonstrating her impressive strength and agility. Tien decides he's ready for his breakfast and heads to the opposite end of the enclosure and the other suspended feeder. He's not as food-focused as his partner. To make up for it, the primate care team give him extra high-calorie snacks during the day. Before long, Kim has emptied her feeder and heads over to see what's left in Tien's. Low-calorie or not, she's still having it. Meanwhile, inside the couple's house, Sarah is busy preparing stage two of their new daily feeding routine. The house has been thoroughly cleaned and she's now putting higher calorie food items in the pair's playroom ready for the afternoon feed. Today, it's juicy orange segments. Just to make it a little bit more interesting and a little bit slower on Kim's part, 
I've put them in some socks and some of these lovely ball pit balls that we've been donated from by the public. Slows them down so they don't just gorge and then go and sit and be bored. Because we put them in different areas around, around the playroom, then um, Tien can perhaps come to one bucket while Kim will work on another one. After a morning spent in the trees, Kim and Tien are back for their afternoon meal. And it's Kim who's first into the house. She heads straight for a food bucket, but discovers it's not going to be that easy. Trying to retrieve pieces of orange from a sock proves taxing. Tien examines the problem for a few moments, but then quickly solves it, making the most of the opportunity to enjoy his meal before Kim comes looking for more. He needn't worry, she's still stumped by the sock. It looks as if the new feeding routine is working out just how the primate care team hoped. Slowing Kim down, reducing her calories, and providing Tien with the opportunity to turn the tables on his partner. There are currently 19 different gibbon species, and the park houses five of them. As well as the golden cheeked, the park has an agile gibbon, a lars, and three mullers, as well as two siamangs, which are the largest of all the gibbon species. Sam and Sasak are a devoted male-female pair who've been together since 2011, when Sasak arrived from Dublin Zoo. They've been inseparable ever since. They are a beautiful couple. They're one of the closest couples we have in our gibbons. Um, they have a very typical relationship between the two of them. Um, Sam spends a lot of time grooming her, um, particularly around the face area, which is very typical of a male Siaman gibbon. They will spend a lot of time grooming their partners and their children and really do focus a lot on the face. They're not the most active of our gibbons, largely because they are the, the biggest gibbons. They're heavier than the rest of the gibbons. So, you know, they tend to just take things at a little bit more of an easy going pace, moving around throughout their enclosure, a little bit more relaxed than some of our more agile guys. Gibbons love to sing, and the early morning song of the park's golden-cheeked gibbons is a beautiful sound. But siamangs are equally impressive. They have large throat sacs that amplify their calls through the tree canopy, announcing to everyone else that this is their territory. Their song tends to be more of a mirror effect, so both gibbons tend to sing exactly the same notes, and you will see them just belt, 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 belting out all these different notes together. Um, till they build up to the great call. Now, the great call is the loudest and most impressive part of the song, and actually that's when you see the two of them are singing different notes in a slightly different way as well. <laughs> Typically, the gibbons like the Golden Cheeks, uh, their song could be heard across the rainforest for about two kilometres. For the Siamangs, that's increased to about five kilometres because of that great big throat sack that they have. So it's really an impressive sound. Siamangs are native to the forests of Indonesia, Malaysia and Thailand, where their diet consists mainly of fruit and leaves. In captivity, the primate care team provide them with a healthy diet, which they can supplement themselves with seasonal fruiting trees and shrubs. This morning, Sasak is making the most of her breakfast, retrieved from a suspended feeder high up in the pear's tree-filled enclosure. But food doesn't keep this doting couple apart for long. It's a perfect spring morning, and at the Marmoset Complex, it's a big day for one of the park's newest arrivals. Gizmo has been getting on so well with his new housemate, Solomon, that the team have decided to let them outside together for the first time. 
so far, Gizmo has been really good. Um, he actually seems quite quite chilled out, and now that he's got Solomon, he seems a lot more confident. I think just having that other marmoset next to him is a lot of reassurance for him. So far, Gizmo is sticking to Solomon like a little shadow. He loves him, and um, so hopefully that should mean as soon as Solomon heads out, Gizmo will hopefully follow too. As far as Steph is aware, this is the first time Gizmo has ever experienced the great outdoors. He has a lot to learn. To start with, there's navigating the long tunnel which leads to the enclosure. Then, there are lots of different branches to conquer once he gets there. He'll also have to adjust to all the different unfamiliar noises in the outdoor setting. So it might be a bit big and scary for Gizmo. His balance is not the best, he's not bad, but he can be a bit sort of wobbly because he's so unused to walking on natural things like branches. Um, so he'll have to figure out how best to move around out there um, and have a look at some of the neighbours as well around him. It's a necessary stage in Gizmo's rehabilitation. When the slide is opened, Solomon heads straight out. But Gizmo isn't so sure. He hangs back, a little uncertain what to do. Solomon is very adept at navigating the tunnels and outside enclosures. He was rescued as a tiny youngster and has had plenty of time to practice. After a few minutes, he heads back into the bedrooms to see where Gizmo is and encourage his hesitant new friend to join him outside. After a few aborted attempts, Gizmo finally takes the plunge, following Solomon through the tunnels and out into the enclosure. The first couple of steps outside, he's a little bit cautious, sort of hopping out, hopping back into the tunnel, hopping out again. Um, he's just figuring out how best to move, which branches are good for him to step on, which ones he feels secure running around on. Um, but that's not taking him very long and he's already sort of moving around the most of the outside enclosure with comparative ease um, and Gizmo just seems delighted by everything. He's, he's making so many happy chirpy noises. He goes outside, happy noises, comes inside, happy noises, Solomon comes and sits next to him, more happy noises. He just seems to be having a lovely time right now. Wherever Solomon goes, Gizmo follows, gradually building his confidence and getting used to the alien sounds and surroundings. Solomon is always there for support. It just kind of shows us how important this natural companionship is for these guys, because as soon as he's had another monkey to hang around with, he's a completely different monkey. He's so much more confident, he's so many more sort of happy chirps and so vocal. It's been really, really lovely to see. It's been a great start to life outdoors for Gizmo, and when he's had enough, he can return to the familiar surroundings of the bedroom. Two hundred miles from the park, Alison is on another rescue mission. This time she's travelling to Mid Wales, following a call for help from the owners of Borth Zoo, Derek and Tracy Tweedy, who can no longer operate and need to rehome some of their animals. Accompanied by Jeremy and Alan, she's greeted by Tracy. Good to see you again. It's been a while. <laughs> it has been. It has been. I can't believe it's been four years. I know. It's gone fast. This is Alan and Jeremy. Hi. OK. Right. So, so she, yeah, yeah, I'll let's show go you. see the guys. Alison is at the zoo to collect two patus monkeys and two capuchins and take them back to Monkey World, along with a vervet monkey who's being rehomed elsewhere. She's keen to meet the animals and establish their condition, as well as their likes, dislikes, and general behavior. First up are the two capuchins. Hey, little man. That's Natty. Oh, that. Louis is a 16-year-old black-capped capuchin who lost his brother a few years ago and was later paired up with Matty, a weeper capuchin who's much older. Hi. <laughs> I know. No, you have to be nice to me. You've got to be nice. Look at that. Oh, he's fantastic. We put them in together and Louis straight away put his arm around Matty and just grinned as if to say, I've got a new brother. And it was just like really heart melting, you know. Um, 
and and they've got on really well. I mean, they they do have the odd fight, obviously, um, over food or toys, um, but on the whole, they get on really well. They groom each other. They sleep in the bed together. Um, and it is really lovely. It was, it was just the best thing we ever did for them. Are you starving right now? Who's boss? Mmm. Monkey World doesn't currently have any weeper capuchins, although Alison suspects Capuchin Gizmo, rescued in 2004, is at least part weeper. Good boy. Yeah, he's feisty. I don't know that Gizmo's <laughs> gonna like him. No, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy wants to take a look at the Capuchin's house and bedrooms so he can come up with a plan to get them into travel crates tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> is it possible, looking at that opening from the eye, is it possible to put something to rest the box onto? Each of the primates will need to be boxed up separately to keep them safe and comfortable. Yeah. Next, it's time to have a look at the Patas monkeys. Come on then, look at what I got. They're called Mr. Pattus and Lady Penelope, but the team at Borth have very few details about them. They arrived in 2011, before the current owners took over, and are extremely shy. Well, she's funny, because she's always hiding in the tree, and to be honest, there's times I've looked in there and I'm like, where is she? Because mm. I can't actually see her. Mm. And it takes some looking and then she's yeah. like, oh, there she is, just peeping. <laughs> yes, spot the Pattus monkey. Last up is Jangles, a vervet monkey who lost his mate a while ago. It's a good boy. Jangles. Jangles won't be joining the primates at Monkey World. The park doesn't have any vervets or close relatives, so he'll be joining another of his own species at a rescue centre in Berkshire. I'm really pleased that we actually came down the night before and have a chance to look at the enclosures. You can be sent photographs, but trying to work out actually how you're gonna encourage the two patas and the two capuchins to walk into their boxes separately um, with the least amount of stress, it's not easy and makes both Jeremy and I a little bit nervous. Alison's hoping tomorrow's rescue will be as calm as the evening view across nearby Borth Beach on the beautiful Welsh coast. Next time on Monkey Life. Come on, Patas. The rescue continues in Wales, but getting the primates into their travel crates is far from straightforward. The thought of Jeremy walking into a room with them is enough just to make them leave immediately. And. A feast of melons for the bachelor chimps.